October meeting, and uh, we've ha we've had uh, some successful meetings so far. Perhaps this might be the last one that we're going to be fully virtual. We're we're hoping, <laughs> and uh, but we've been um, able to do them virtual uh, during COVID nineteen quite well, I think. And um, yeah, it's good to have Doug Doug here from uh, overseas. So excellent. Go to agenda. So John's presentation uh, slightly changed the title, Think Like a Marine to Disrupt Your Opponent's Projects. Uh, at last meeting, I, I presented on the digital workplace uh, design and talked about the need to need to have a strategy, even, even when you're implementing things um, on the fly, as we did in COVID-19, around the Teams platform, those sort of things, you still need to have a strategy to ensure that you're aligning to the strategic objectives. And I also talked about the, the other parts of the platform that you need, uh, collaboration and integration and, and how the, uh, the COVID-19 actually uh, boosted the digital, the growth in uh, digital services. Uh, looked at the capability-based approach, looking at uh, people, process, information and uh, platform technologies, not just the, not the, just the technologies. And I broke down a uh, technology roadmap to sort of give uh, how you can give guidance to say the, the technical folk that are on uh, the team. Uh, so that, yeah, that was last meeting. So I'm gonna hand over to um, John. Uh, John's presentation is going to go for around 40 minutes and uh, with, with a chance to have uh, some questions uh, towards the end. And yeah, I was quite, quite excited to, uh, to, and looking forward to John's presentation. Yeah, John, did you want to have a go at sharing or um, did you want me to do it? What's... Um, two questions. First off, I had Someone posted that they'd like a recording of this presentation. Are you able to turn yep. on the record? It is recording. And next thing, I will request remote control. If that works fine, I'll keep going with that. If not, we'll go back to plan B. Yep. Which is you hit the Stop sharing. <laughs> so you're requesting? Yes. I haven't seen anything come through yet. Uh, in which case, just... Yep. Oh, that's another person. I'll see if I can share my screen. Yep, you've, you've started. Yeah, good job. Fantastic. That well didn't work last night, so I'm very happy. <laughs> yep. All right. So... Thank you, everyone, for being here today. What I wanted to do was present a topic to promote thinking about what we're doing here. And hence, in today's presentation, I'm a business philosopher. So we're thinking about thinking. And <clears throat> what I'd like to do is introduce a viewpoint that is not that common in Australian uh, management. It's much more common in American management because in America, the uh, Marines actually move into industry and they apply what they've learnt in industry and do some interesting things that don't necessarily happen in Australia. So I'd like to introduce you to Think Like a Marine. First off, the house rules. Uh, questions are most welcome. If you know how to post them in the LinkedIn event, I'll ask that Nigel keeps uh, a view of those. And at the breaks, there are four sections in the presentation. If there's something uh, worthwhile there, Nigel, can you ask that question on behalf of whoever wants that? Okay. Um, Nigel will publish the slide deck at the end to the LinkedIn group. I'm skimming over a number of issues here. If you want to find out more, there's a book reference at the back, which is probably the best available uh, material on what I'm talking about today. 
Um, so the introduction is, I've been working in projects for 35 years, and it seems like we go down much the same rabbit holes in a lot of those projects. And one of the things that I've seen on many occasions is that we need, uh, just a moment, I can't see my, no, that's better. Uh, this heroic efforts are done by dedicated managers and motivated teams. And often these managers and teams are taken out of the business and put onto the project for a period of time. And the projects seem to take a long time. They're often late or rescheduled and regularly fail to deliver what was they promised in their plans. And in particular, I'd summarise that as um, there's a thing called the Project Iron Triangle and I'm sure you've seen the posters on the wall saying you can have two of time, cost and quality only. Choose wisely. So one of my questions here is, is it possible to eliminate the Project Iron Triangle and get time, cost and quality in the one project? Hey, John. Um would you mind just turning off your video because we're just getting uh, some disruption. If we can save bandwidth, that would be good. Oh, video. Just turn your video off. Thanks. Uh, have I turned it off now? Is that better? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. Okay, so the outline of today's presentation is going to be a quick one. And it's asking the question, how would a Marine turn your competitor's strengths in their project portfolio into a weakness? So this is different thinking to backwards thinking to the way that we normally try and uh, solution. So today's goal is to prompt a conversation and I promise not to give too many solutions. Like many people, I uh, have my biggest failing is I jump to the solutions. So today, we're going to talk about three topics, four topics, sorry. First off, how are Marines trained to think differently? Uh, and then apply a quick understanding of what they uh, do in, when they're thinking to generate tactics to disrupt your competitors' projects and two strategies to disrupt their portfolio. And then finally, uh, some uh, further thoughts for where to go next following this presentation. For those who are in the ADCAR world, this is an awareness presentation only, or that's my goal. <clears throat> so the first topic is think like a Marine. So the US Marines work in an environment <clears throat> that's risky, dangerous, and changes rapidly. And so how do they make good decisions in the fog of battle? And more importantly, uh, why did they change from using large concentrations of force like D-Day landings, which was the old style of the US Marines that existed for over a century. And they changed to using agile units whose goal is to be never where their opponents expect them to be. And the question is, uh, first off, how did they make that change? Because that's a huge cultural change. And the second one is, uh, what was it that they learned that gave them this new way of working? So, <clears throat> what I've done here is summarise what is often at least a day and a half training. So, I've broken it down to three principles. Uh, in the marine thinking. So if you've come from a world of quality management or engineering, this is a very different set of principles to the, those environments. And that's part of the benefit of talking about this today. So first off, success starts at the pivot point and we'll uh, describe what that is. Uh, the next principle is tempo or the pace of change multiplies the leverage at a pivot point. And the third principle is 
uh, Colonel John Boyd's OODA loop. That OODA stands for Observe, Orient, Decide and Act. Sets the tempo. So the idea is that they break down the way that they're thinking into these three steps. Now, there are other things that they do as well, and that's for another day. But these are the ones I'd like to talk about today. So Colonel John Boyd uh, was a US Air Force fighter pilot who developed a way of dogfighting that uh, revolutionized the way that fighter pilots uh, fought battles in the sky. It also changed the way that planes were built because planes weren't built to fight a good fight in the sky. So he's credited with uh, changing the first major update to the strategies in Sun Tzu's art of war in over 2300 years. So uh, if you're interested in finding about more about Colonel John Boyd, he, his story is an interesting one and his biography is called uh, John Boyd, the fighter pilot who changed the art of war. Um, he identified that the US Marines culture of planned D-Day frontal assaults was a major problem for the US military. And he campaigned to change that. For nine years, he presented his one and a half day presentation to the senior leadership. And frankly, they thought he was crazy. And if you've ever been involved in a transformation program, that's often the first response, you're crazy. Um, the interesting thing though, was whenever something went wrong or went very right, he'd be asked to come back and repeat that presentation. <clears throat> the interesting thing is the generals would always say, I'm a busy general, I've only got an hour, can you break it down to an hour presentation? And he would always respond, it's, it takes one and a half days to understand this. Um, and they come back again and say, look, we've booked the uh, general for, for four hours. Um, are you able to give the presentation? And he have to say, it's one and a half days. And eventually they would, the general would uh, make a whole of them one and a half days in their schedule and they'd have the presentation. And that's very important for us when we're thinking about our transformation efforts. Uh, there are a number of transformation uh, processes out there and they all seem to take a day and a half. And it's to do with changing our thinking. <clears throat> the interesting th thing happened in the 10th year was the junior officers that were in those early presentations um, applied his advice and were highly successful and they were promoted to senior leadership. So the change actually happened because they were now in charge and it was crazy not to do what he taught. Okay, there's the story. So let's look at the first principle, which is my take on uh, his training course. Um, success starts at the pivot point. This is particularly important when there's high risk, a rapidly unfolding situation, or you're dealing with great deal of uncertainty, um, typically a strategic kind of problem. So what you're looking for is a pivot point, or in military terms from the German Schwerpunkt, uh, where you're looking for where a small effort produces a large outcome. And for the uh, frontal assault style of military, this seems to be really contrary to their style of thinking. So you're looking for places where you've got a great deal of leverage and you're going to exploit those. Um, importantly, uh, because John Boyd came from fighter pilots, they actually create a point of leverage and it may only last for half a second. And that's the time that you have to act. It may last slightly longer in other environments. If you're in security, it may, uh, the pivot point may last only a millisecond or so. This is uh, something that's uh, not 
covered in your quality management courses. So, and of course you're saying their pivot point, what do you mean? They are there, but they hide in the least obvious places. And this is one of the challenges for this approach is that we're saying there is something that you can do, but it's not where you normally look. And importantly, John Boyd to the military demonstrated what he was talking about by going through all the major historical battles and explaining them from this new principle. And he started with Alexander the Great, who was um, the first Grand Master in using the pivot point. And so he identified the pivot points that Alexander the Great uh, chose before his battle and his campaign and followed those through. And that's an interesting one for you if you want to find out more about that. Um, the next principle is that the pivot point gives you leverage, but the really interesting thing is time or tempo, the pace at which you change multiplies the leverage at the pivot point. Importantly, if we're disrupting our opponents, Marines would like our opponents' quality governance and decision processes to make them five minutes late to their battle. And this is not something uh, that we think about clearly in many cases on projects, that the time of the decision and action actually can uh, strongly influence the outcome. And importantly, they use Boyd's OODA loop to set the tempo. And what this means is it is not a quality process, even though it uses it. It's not an engineering process, even though it uses it. Um, change management and learning all play an important role in the OODA loop, but they are just components of that loop and not the primary uh, principles that dictate what Marines do. Um, here is the OODA loop sketch. I've said, don't panic, please. Um, you can see across the top there, it says observe, orient, decide and act. And importantly, it includes all those other processes in that um, orient uh, stage there with all those little arrows there. Uh, it employs, it combines the concepts of thinking fast and thinking slow for those of you who have studied that area. And it does take the one and a half days to understand and apply each of those feedback loops. So each of those arrows there has some stories associated with it. And this is the reason it takes a day and a half. Uh, we'll just go past there. Obviously, this is the diagram from the end of that day and a half training. So in a nutshell, thinking like a Marine, uh, success starts at the pivot point. Uh, tempo multiplies the leverage at the pivot point and John Boyd Zoo Loop sets the tempo. Um, so that's the end of this section there. Uh, Nigel, do we have any questions? Uh, not yet. Um, I open up, okay. to the, open up to the floor if there's anything quickly. More a comment, Nigel, than uh, an actual question uh, for you, John. Um, in business architecture, we talk about the uh, trim rider, and I'm sure I'm going to pronounce it wrong, but the schwa punkt uh, is what we would equate to the trim rider in terms of finding the uh, smallest change. So when you're trying to turn a big ship, uh, you don't put full rudder on. You actually use a trim rudder to get the uh, largest degree of change. Not that I'm a marine expert. Uh, so very similar um, analogy, um, you know, that we use, find the capabilities that with a little bit of trimming will give you the best advantage in your organization and the, in the industry. Yes. And in fact, the trim, trim tab is the example of a pivot point that what you do is you have a smart, a tiny trim tab that needs a small motor to turn it. 
that then directs the um, flow of water around the rudder, which shifts the rudder. And then the rudder has amazing leverage over the front of the ship. And the idea there being that you're multiplying the leverage. And you're, that's actually the solutioning stage and uh, well spotted that the pivot point and the trim tab are the same concept. Uh, and when we start to do the solutioning, obviously the trim tab comes in as the analogy that helps there. Cool. The, um, why I like uh, the military analogy is the pivot point doesn't actually have to be something physical. And often it's the pivot point that they're working on in their uh, more advanced stuff is inside the heads of their opponents. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's a fascinating study. But anyway, uh, coming back to using it in business, um, the idea being is that this principle is pretty universal that success starts at the pivot point. If you can find the thing that you need to change that has the biggest impact and uh, low effort involved, uh, that's the one to go for. And what we'll do now is take this idea and apply it in reverse to say, how would we like to slow up progress in our competitors? So the Marines top two tactics for disrupting their opponents. First off, add friction to their pivot point. So they're looking for single points of failure or a single point of delay that they can access and do and make a change uh, for their competitor. Uh, and they practice this in battle and also in strategy. Uh, another way is your critical resources or your system constraints are your system constraint, which is a pivot point. So if you flood the critical resource with unnecessary work or interruptions, you reduce the ability of that critical resource to do useful work. And that one is used often. Um, also, what we want to do is make sure that uh, they react to everything. So we create uh, low cost um, actions that create urgency in their environment for them to jump to making changes to what they want to do. And so we want them to work on everything and we want to give them a long list of everything to work on. And of course, if we change priorities on their list, we're switching them around and importantly, keeping them away from uh, finishing what they want to do. Okay, so that's the first tactic, which is add friction to their pivot point. The next tactic, which is a, probably a new one for um, engineers, is dictate the tempo of the OODA loop. So if we create surprises, they take longer to make sense of that. So they get stuck in their orientation loop. And in fact, uh, one of the tactics that they talk about is observe, orient, observe, orient, observe, orient. And I think we've seen um, some of our projects get in there that they never actually make a decision and that leads to an action. And that's one of the ways of dictating the tempo is you can break their OODA loop. Another one is to overstate their risks. Um, and this is used often uh, by people like Amazon to their competitors. Um, you want your opponents to be cautious and slow to act because they want to understand all the risks. And the real reason that you're doing that is that there are some big gain options that require big risk, but they can only succeed at high tempo. So a focus on risk management can actually prevent you from uh, doing the big game transformations. Faster decisions, faster actions. 
if you make decisions and act faster than your opponent's decision making, we will appear to be a complex problem to them because they're having trouble understanding what we're doing and we become unpredictable. And when we're unpredictable, we can dictate the outcome. Does that make sense there for the tactics? So those, are, in a nutshell, there are quite a number more than that, but they're the ones that I felt that were most uh, applicable to a project environment. Any comments, questions? Doesn't okay. appear to be any comments there, so you can keep going, John. All right, so now we talk about strategies. So strategies are about disrupting the portfolio. Those tactics there are in the heat of the moment. Strategies start to look at things in structure, uh, culture, etc., that you can um, leverage to uh, impact your opponent's ability to do a good job. Okay, the first strategy is slow down their OODA loop. If we can make it so that they only make their changes on a 15 month cycle, we're already in a position to uh, succeed over the longer term. And importantly, organisation complexity is something that the transformation for the Marines had a huge impact on. So they ended up creating a three layer organisation whose layers are to do strategy, tactics and operations. There are no other layers in their organisation. And the reason that they did that is an ideal opponent has four or more layers. And the more layers you have, the slower your OODA loop. And so a four layer organisation uh, from first principles can't compete with a three layer organisation. And of course, if you show a Marine the following organisation structure, they know it is an absolute doddle to defeat their opponent. So if you have an organisation structure like that, they will change at a rate that you can change in a three layer organisation, which will completely overwhelm uh, the people there. It doesn't matter what kind of people you've got, the structure of this organisation, the comp competing organisation will ensure that they can't get the job done and they can't compete. Next one, slowing down their OODA loop, is overwhelm command and control. So a lot of organisations have top-down decision-making where executives have 15 plus hour days. And of course, the Marine's response to that is to create new stresses that force decisions back up the organisation so that the executives have even longer days. And this was a problem that they had in their old world. They had a very top heavy command and control structure and the solution that they came up with this is rather interesting. Um, create cost. If your opponent always makes decisions about cost above everything else, um, a Marine will create situations where the obvious solutions are expensive, which will once again uh, add delays to their OODA loop. And of course, importantly, disrupt communication. So uh, importantly, they love opponents who have multiple communication channels for different types of decisions, and they will trigger um, situations where uh, the information goes up multiple channels and uh, making a decision in that environment is always much slower than if there is a single path for decisions. All right, now the next strategy is a rather interesting one, is misdirect them from the pivot point. If, and I've only put one example here, 
if we get our competitors to put all their effort where the pivot point isn't, we've effectively uh, unfocused them from what they need to do to get the job done. So the waste their effort uh, approach is emphasise that they need to work on addictive solutions that don't have an impact on the pivot point. And they're addictive in the sense that um, when you try them, they don't work out so well, so you do it again. And um, these solutions have been given the name, uh, the seven seductive solutions. And these are the things that you want your competitors to be working on. You want them to be choosing these kinds of solutions for their projects. Now, from a, um, when I first found this one, I was a little bit upset because I think I've been involved in every one of those. Um, and I'll leave it with you there. There are others for Mr. X from the pivot point, but uh, I'll leave you with this list here. And that brings us to further thoughts. Importantly, projects are much more than what project managers do and projects aren't defined by what project management is. So just reiterate the three principles that I introduced today. Success starts at the pivot point or the trim tab as uh, pointed out. Tempo multiplies the leverage at the pivot point and John Boyd's OODA loop sets the tempo. Um, importantly, we had some examples of how to use those principles to disrupt an opponent's portfolio. And importantly, thinking like a Marine leads to actions that are in direct conflict to quality and engineering principles. And part of the solution needs to reconcile those conflicts. So I'll leave you with that as the summary there. Uh, the major conflict is, for example, uh, quality management is all about uh, making cycle time reliable and OODA loop is about deliberately being unreliable on your cycle time for a particular effect. So the closing questions for you here is how would a marine rate your project portfolio and do you know the pivot points for your portfolio? Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Yeah, thanks, thanks, John. That's um, that's extraordinary. I was, uh, yeah, I'm quite amazed. It's it's not often that you get uh, uh, such new content that I haven't known about before. But uh, yeah, there's quite a number of the organisations that uh, I've uh, been in have had that type of structure, with the uh, you know the portfolio <laughs> office, the project office, the uh, um, the benefits realization, yeah, it's 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 amazing. It's a wonder that <laughs> that innovation doesn't happen. Uh, <laughs> so I'll open up to the floor. Or, um, uh, would anyone like to have a go at uh, answering some of those those two questions? John uh, Nigel Tender here. Uh, so really powerful. Wow. Um, <laughs> I guess you could apply this at a portfolio level, a program level, and a project level. I guess what are the implications for, you know, we've got agile uh, scenarios, which can tend to be a, a real spaghetti of <laughs> all of this on multiple levels without an end in, in sight. Uh, I guess, how do you relate this approach to sort of agile versus, versus a, a, a waterfall normal sort of project delivery method Okay, um, <laughs> to stretch the analogy, the um, frontal assault on the beaches is the waterfall method. And what Marines do now is the agile method. And in fact, um, the, the agile method actually took on the principles of uh, the Marines, thinking like a Marine, because the people involved had actually been trained as a Marine. Uh, so one of the issues that we've got there, there is a culture clash between um, frontal assault and uh, being where your opponent thinks you aren't, <laughs> uh, which changes that. And part of the issue with the solutioning, of course, is 
Um, as you can see, if you add another layer to your organization called the Agile Project, you're actually taking a nine layer organization and putting a 10th layer in. And of course, a Marine would say, you're on a hiding to nothing. So a lot of the issues that we have with project management is the history of workarounds and the interesting solution, the first pivot point for this, which is part of the one and a half day training is that there is a single root cause for why projects are late. It's been known for 2,600 years. It has no name and it's not measured. So what I'm saying is the way we're trying to solve the problem is actually generating more situations and putting Agile over the top of a um, waterfall environment is actually making the problem worse because you're adding extra friction to the OODA loop. Yeah, really powerful. <laughs> it's crazy. I know. <laughs> I've got a question. Hi, Ollie. Hi, hi John. Hope you're well. I um, really enjoyed that. And as you know from some of our the previous conversations we've had, I'm, I'm on the outside looking into a potential breakthrough in my understanding here. Um, maybe you could help me get across the line. It, it seems like it seems like one of the things I'm taking away from this is that, and from your last answer to your last question is that in an organization that is structured perhaps more the way the Marines work, the, the taxonomy of project management is maybe not even required because the objectives of the organization and the, you know, the seductive solutions and all, all of those kind of things have been dealt with and put to one side. So their ability to, to move or to, to, to identify the pivot point and move in the direction they want to move in doesn't require, yeah. is, that, is, that, is that the takeaway or one of the takeaways? Uh, I would suggest that um, when I first started on this journey, I created 20 hypotheses about why projects uh, work the way they were. Um, and the one that helped me the most was the actual pivot point for successful projects lies outside the boundary of your portfolio office. Uh -huh. And so working on doing better project management, doing better program management, etc., is not going to solve the problem. Uh, we spend a lot of time at it and uh, that's, if you like, the eighth seductive solution is getting a better project management methodology. Um, so what I'm suggesting here is that by understanding the pivot points, we can start to resolve those problems. Obviously, I've identified multiple layers of organisation, um, create problems. And until we measure the impact of the problems that that creates, we're going to have trouble improving on it. And so that's, I'll just see, let's see if I can, that's the thank you. Mm. And there's uh, the um, certain to win. Uh, if you're in the business of strategy in your business, uh, if you haven't read that, you won't understand what's going on once you've read it you'll have a much better idea of how strategy should be working in business. Um, and what I've got here is an outline of how to solve that. So the goal of the one and a half day transformation is actually how do we create an organisation that can uh, create compelling offers like 100 days or it's free for our projects. So I just... Um, many organisations actually have 100 days or it's free for their projects. Um, and the big battery in South Australia was the one that made the news. The next thing is I've identified um, six pivot points that impact an organisation. And by thinking like a Marine, and working through those pivot points and uh, polishing the leverage that you can get at each of those pivot points, 
you can end up creating an organisation where you can make a compelling offer that your industry cannot and will not match uh, the offer because the crazy productivity that you have, they can't reproduce. So that, and in the process of doing that, we will fix projects. The interesting thing is to fix projects, we have to fix services as well. And the solutions are exactly the same solution. It's a rather fascinating uh, result. But I said I wasn't going to talk solutions today. Does that help, Ollie? Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank, thank you, John. John, it's Christine. Um, just thinking about all of this, um, you know, and, and how you talk about pivot, um, the framework that I like to use is what I call the integrated agile approach. And when I talk about agile, it's not about agile safe. Um, and it comes back to how you interpret pivot points. It's about what the business wants from us, which is being adaptive and responsive. That's what agility is like. Mm. Um, and for me, by thinking like a Marine, you're constantly having to think about um, adapting and uh, responding. Otherwise you're going to be left behind. Um, the other point I wanted to make as well is um, a lot of organizations focus far too much on the project delivering the change rather than looking at it as the whole organization needs to work together for change to be successful. Mm -hmm. So it starts from when an idea is presented or a problem arises right through to the point when the change is adopted and embedded in the organization successfully. And, uh, you know, to use my uh, a phrase that Peter Grant coined, um, you know, to set aside your disciplined bigotry, there's no one methodology. And in this case, you know, project management, uh, architecture, solution design, waterfall, none of them are better than the others. And we actually need to come together as one team with our disciplines mm -hmm. in order to be adaptive uh, and responsive because that's what's going to make us resilient and able to respond to the changes in the industry. Yes, very much so. You've nominated three of the six pivot points. <laughs> Excellent. Yay. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> Okay, that's that's been excellent, uh, John. John, it's um, and yeah, I particularly like the the structure and the the new new thinking behind it, strategy, strategy tactics, and operations. Uh, that seems to be a, a good three level structure compared to some of the more detailed ones that we have out there. Uh, I'll just grab the share here. So. Okay. Uh, so thanks, thanks so much, John, for that uh, presentation. Um, we're intending to have one more uh, presentation at the end of the year. Have you seen my slides there? I think you are. Yeah. Uh, and to have a uh, Christmas party. Uh, so we have the, our meetings on the second, uh, second Wednesday of every month. And uh, we're proposing to um, have that at uh, a face-to-face -face meeting, if people, people like that and uh, business aspect of the said they can uh, provide the location um, at uh, uh, 555 Coronation Drive in Brisbane. Now, um, and that could be either in the morning or the um, or an evening session. So, just I just wanted to put it out there to people. Um, do you think we're ready to have a like a face to face one again, and we can have it as a blended uh, blended session, so you can still attend virtually? Or would you like? I'm definitely ready for that. What's that? Sorry. I'm definitely ready for that. I'll be right there. <laughs> it would be great to see you, Doug. 
<laughs> Elbows are us, or fist pumps, or. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so we'll put that. Um, so we've got the conversations, uh, of course, in the uh, uh, to stay in touch on our uh, LinkedIn website, uh, business designers for tomorrow. Uh, we've got 79 members there now, um, and it's uh, been great to have uh, everyone here today um, as well. Um, we've got uh, that, uh, the LinkedIn site is for, uh, you can post interesting articles, and there's been quite a, quite a few articles actually on there now. Um, community questions and get information about uh, what's coming up. Um, ask for any uh, help and particularly uh, so John's presentation we've recorded this today uh, so we'll we'll put that on to um, YouTube and then I'll put the link on uh, LinkedIn as well uh, to see that so um, and John's also uh, offered to uh, share the slides as well so we'll put we'll put that up on the LinkedIn side that's that's correct isn't it John We're just on mute, but yeah. <laughs> yes. Excellent. Uh, now, just topics for next um, for next meeting. Um, I do have a like a data strategy presentation that I can do. Um, I believe if Jeff's still on the line, there, uh, Jeff did have a topic as a possibility. Um, and yeah, anyone, anyone's uh, able to uh, volunteer to, uh, to, to speak. Nigel, at the last session, um, we were going to get an executive in uh, to come and talk to us about uh, what they want from us, uh, mm. designers and architects. That's right. And Tony Welch had uh, offered to be the executive to tell us, you know, how they like to receive in information from us. Mm. That sounds good to me. Yeah, yeah, that sounds that sounds brilliant. That's so. Uh, I'll get in touch with Tony. Uh, I did I did hear from him that he was uh, putting something together. So um, that'll be excellent. And yeah, hello to uh, some of the other folk that haven't spoken today, Rika and Alal, uh, Jeremy. Um, hope you're all doing well and you enjoyed uh, John's presentation today. Yes, it's been great. Yep. Excellent. Okay. Uh, is there any uh, last words? Last words there? Hello, are you what, surviving you. down in Melbourne there? Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's good, but yeah. Which we push pushing the um, uh, the Zoom to the limit, Zoom teams and everything. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, I'll have to catch up for a coffee next time I'm down in Melbourne. Let's, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Oh, so can I come over for, for the, the Christmas party? Yeah. I don't know if I'm allowed to. Yeah, it sounds like a good idea. Come on. days beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, guys. Okay, so it's been a fabulous meeting. Um, I've, I've taped it and everything, so uh, that'll be on uh, on YouTube in the next couple of days. And... Uh, great to have you all here. Thanks, John. It was a great presentation. Thanks, John. Thanks, Nigel. Thank you, John. Yep. Good job. Thank you. Thanks, Nigel. Thank you. Thanks, John. Cheers. Bye.